I have a 32 foot center console. It's a fish around design contender. Um, I've been uh, going offshore now in center console for about 10 years. Interestingly enough, I know when I first started going out there, I was one of the only supposedly dumb small boats out there 10 years ago. You know, and the crazy thing about it is back then I was like, man, am I really that crazy? Am I that young and dumb? But interestingly enough, now with the confidence that people have in their power and the new power plant, there's a lot more center consoles out there. And I see a lot of mid 20s console boats out there. So, you know, Ruben, what do you run? 27. Nice. <laughs> but, but I got to tell you guys, at the end of the day, as long as we know what our shortcomings are, you know, um, and what our challenges are, we can catch fish with the best of them, have a lot more fun, and I can tell you that the effort that we'll put in and the time it's going to take to clean a boat and everything else and our speed, at the end of the day, we always trump and win. Trust me when I tell you. Um, I go up against these big sporties, the cannon runner in the 60s, and I got to tell you, they're formidable fishing machines. And if we're talking about trolling, the last thing you want to do is be up against a big sporty. I'm telling you right now, I'll admit it, you guys may not want to admit it, but at the end of the day, trolling up against a 60-footer or against a green stick boat, you're going to lose. We do not have the harmonics. We have something at play against us that's really going to play against us, and we're not going to be successful. Um, when we troll, and I'm going to go over trolling spread, prop wash is our enemy, guys. That's the bottom line. That is our shortcoming. Um, you know, for years, I, I didn't want to admit it, but at the end of the day, that is the reality. This is going to kill us every day, all day. This prop wash, all that stuff coming off, it's against us. There is ways that you can get around it, and you can avoid it, and still be successful, but let's be 100% clear here, guys. We're going to talk about unconventional techniques to be successful in the canyon, and it doesn't mean trolling for six to eight hours. You guys may not want to admit it, but I will not troll more than a couple hours. It's not going to happen, guys. Not on my watch, because guess what? There's too much going on. Just like you guys are looking at me and you're looking at your buddies and you're like, man, we've been trolling for four hours and we got nothing. This sucks. Guys, there is a lot to do out there. Change up your techniques, do something different, but to troll three, four hours and not get a bite, you're wasting your time, guys. You really are. And this past year, the troll bite was pretty bad. I mean, it was as bad as I've seen in a long time. However, there are some things that you can do to make yourself successful. And what I want to go over is a couple things that we'll do to, to make sure that we're successful. So let's start by where we're going to fish. I am jealous of you guys out here to the east because you guys are going to get on these eddies before we get them. So if you're looking at the coastline, and this is Long Island, and this is Jersey, okay, and this is Manasquan down here, right? Here's the Hudson, here's the dip, and obviously you have the tails here. The Gulf Stream is running this way, and the eddies are going to break, and they're always going to break off to the north. They're going to come through hydrographers. They're going to come through Atlantis. They're going to come their way down through the tail, the dip, the Hudson, and work its way south. That's what eddies do, right? Now, you guys are going to get wind of it before. The advantage that I have is if I'm in Manasquan before all the rest of the guys, I've got connects like my buddy Charlie and another buddy, uh, buddies out here that will tell me, yo, that water that's in the dip, has no fish. Don't even bother fishing it. So I'll let that one pass me by. I'm not going to run 100 miles out there, guys, to go fish water that has no fish in it. Don't do that. Uh, I was young and dumb like 10, 15 years ago. I would run 140 miles out to the 1,000. Like, oh, man, look at that water. It looks great on the sat shot. But there's no fish in it. I have commercial contacts that have long liners. And I have friends up north. And they'll tell me, man, that eddy has fish. When it comes and hits the Hudson, get ready. And normally they're right. This past year, there wasn't any fish, but that's another story. So that's how we figure out where I'm going. The furthest I'll run is up to the dip from Manasquan, but I'm using the Hudson, Tom's, Linden Cole, and vice versa. So let's talk about what I do when I get to the canyon. Now this can work for any canyon. It does not matter what canyon you're in, but every canyon has a tip and every canyon has a wall, okay? Both east and west wall. For this particular case, we'll just use the Hudson. So this is the west side, this is the east side. Here's the east elbow, west elbow, and then the tip. What I'll do when I show up to the canyon is I usually want to go with a couple buddy boats. Normally, center console boats as fast as me or faster, right? And we're going to go in tandem. 
I, if I'm doing a day trip, I usually leave around 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. I do 30 to 40 knots at night, guys. Here's my deal. If you hit some at 15, 20 knots, it's the same thing at 30, 40. That's, 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 that's the reality. Let, let us keep it 100% real. Exactly. And, and, guys, and guys, let's, let's be real. You were going to say something profound. No, I know. Exactly. <laughs> keep it, I mean, keep it real. Here's I mean, the deal, guys. Here's the deal, guys. If you're going to hit it, you're going to hit it. You know, listen, knock on wood. I've been doing this now 10 years running in the dark and yet to hit something, right? But if you're going to hit it, just, you know, be prepared on what you're going to be your game plan if you do hit it. But remember, with our outboards, when you hit something, it's going to pop up. It's a scary feeling. I've hit a turtle. It's the scariest feeling. But that's what they're designed to do if you don't know this. Outboards hit something. They pop up. That's what they do. They don't break. They don't rip apart. They just pop up. But it's a scary ass feeling though, because <laughs> the whole it is like boom. You're like, what the hell? And then I see this turtle in pieces. But you know, but yeah. So that's what happens. So they pop up. If you run across anything that's like prop, like rope, which I've done, you just hear wind, just back it down, unwinder, and just keep it going. So what we'll do is on a day trip, we leave around one o'clock. We want to get there at gray light. Everyone's familiar with gray light, right? You want to get there where the sun hasn't come up. There's just enough that you can see. You can start seeing mammals, and the mammals we look for, flipper is not your friend. Now, my man, close your ears back there. They suck, okay? Flippers suck. But if you see rizzos, rizzos are those bigger dolphins with the white blotches. Those are rizzos. Those are good. But can someone tell me what is the number one mammal you're looking for out there? Exactly. That is the one you want. Birds. If you're inshore and you're blue fishing, um, those little tuna chicks with storm petrels are good, and a cane is not so good. They're not real good for me. The best bird to look for in a cane is, is a shearwater. Is anyone familiar with a shearwater? There's those long, long, long arm ones. They swoop. They're the ones that when you're shark fishing, they can go down 30 feet. That's what you're looking for. So those are the, the factors that you're looking for. So when we show up to the canyon, usually I have a buddy boat with me. If for that particular day I don't have a buddy boat, I'm going to find a buddy boat. So I'm going to get out on 65 and call someone like, hey, this is Andrew's toy coming to the canyon. Anyone got a report for me at the Hudson Tip? Whoever comes back to me first is my friend for the day. And I'm going to tell them, hey, Cap, why don't you go to another channel? If they do agree, we agree on a channel we go to and we work it together. If he's on the west side, I'm like, Cap, I just came in. I'll work the east side. We'll work this thing in tandem until we get to the corners. And whoever finds them calls the other one in. That's how I start a lot of my friendships. So what will happen is as he's working the west wall, I'll work the east wall. And I tend to go out in like 500 feet onto the flats, out to 1,000, looking for what I want to look for, be it the mammals or the birds. What will happen is after about an hour or so of this and my ADD starts to kick in and I'm getting real bored, I'm going to be like, listen, we're going to have to do something. So I look for the first pot. When I see that first pot, I'm going to approach it in a certain way. And I do this more for action. Now, mind you, before I make that decision, did everyone fish that Hudson last year when that bite was on in the middle? Did anybody get in on that? No, the real good one in August. The, the chunk bite in August, the end of August. Did anybody get in on that bite? That was one week of 15 to 20 fish, all 50, 60 pound fish, hand feeding right next to the boat in the middle of the day. It was insane. I know I missed it by 12 hours. Dude, I missed it by 12 hours. What are you talking about? But that was unbelievable. Let's just assume that you get to the Hudson or any canyon you're fishing. There is no bite. There is no tuna. There's nothing going on. You're going to have to figure this out because you just made a commitment on fuel, gas, bait to run 100 miles in your center console. You're going to have to make it work. So what you do is you prospect. If you don't have a buddy boat or you haven't met a buddy boat, you got to figure this thing out. So what will happen is, is once I get to the canyon, my, my thinking is, is I'm going to look for the, for the signs. If there is no bite, I'm going to start at the tip and work my way out to the deep. Now, if there's a bite like it was here, I'll run straight to it, right? Knowing that's where the tuna and that's where the pilot whales are. What will happen is, is you get to this hot spot, whatever the hot spot of the day is. In this particular case, it was at the mouth in 5,000 5, feet of water between the two corners, the square and the 150.050. So you get there, 
You're gonna see at least 50 to 60 big sporties. You're gonna see about two or three dozen green stick boats. Everyone knows what a green stick boat is, right? And when you get there, then no one's catching. What do you do then? You're like, man, these guys have all the latest, greatest gear and they're not raising tuna. And you just made this commitment. What do you do? So what we'll do is we'll run our spread and I'm gonna go into our trolling spread and we'll hit this and we'll mow the grass with the best of them. We'll get in there, we'll muck it up and we'll mix it up with them. However, let's be realistic here, guys. We have center console boats. We have that nasty ass wine. We have all this bubble trail. We're not gonna raise a big eye from 150 feet of water. It's not gonna happen, guys. Let's just, just keep call a spade a spade. I can give you the best spread I think will work, but after an hour or two, if nobody's catching, you're not gonna raise them either. However, what you wanna do is you wanna be focused on your machine on where you're marking the fish. They're there because the pilot whales are there and the fleet's there, it's just they haven't turned on. What we look for is our machine is any fish from 150 feet up to the surface. Once we start marking now my machine is a ball, it's a big blob. Like, okay, there she is, okay, she's at 120. I'll start hitting waypoints and figure out where they're at. Once I've kind of connected the dots and know where patches of fish are, I'm going to figure out which way the wind and the current is. And I'm going to start day chunking right in front of the fleet. In front of everyone, in between everyone, I don't care. I just made a 100 mile run, I'm going for mine. Guess what? I'm not worried about etiquette and anything at that point because it's every man for himself. So at that point, I found a couple patches of fish out here that I've marked. I already figured out that my current and wind direction is going to go this way. I'm going to start day chunking for these things. I stumbled on this a couple of years ago and this is what I came up with. These were multiple big eyes, one after the other in the middle of the day on just a piece of chunk, a hundred feet down and then they eventually started eating right out of my chum chucker during the middle of the day when there was a hundred boats literally just crushing them. And what happens is guys, is these fish are here and they're spooked and they're staying deep and they are not coming up and it doesn't matter what you do. If they're not coming up for the big sporties with their harmonics and the big green stick boat, they damn well ain't coming up for your little outboard egg beaters. It ain't gonna happen. So you gotta drop your baits and your chunks down to them. It's true, right? You're, you're like laughing, but you know it's true. It's like, <laughs> dude, I'm like frustrated. No one's catching this, sucks. Drop the baits and a chunk down to those guys. And that's the like unconventional stuff that I'm talking to you about. This is in the middle of the day. We're watching them feed. We're seeing yellow fins. We're seeing big eyes. Drop the bait and the chunks down to that where they're comfortable because they're not going to come up and eat. But if you drop it down to them, you can get them to bite. So that's what, how we'll approach. Currents. Okay. Yeah, you got to figure out the wind and the current. And then what you got to do is you got to do enough prospecting to know where they're sitting because wherever they're sitting, that's where they're comfortable. They're swimming in circles. That's where the squid is at. That's where they feel comfortable. And as long as you can get them away from everyone else and figure out where they're at, you have a really good shot to chunk them in the daytime. You're always taking... You know, you're going out with the uh, prospect of trolling. trolling. But you better bring flats. But you're bringing Oh, you same better same bring same flats. Same time. Absolutely. So what we... Chunk all the time. No, we don't chunk all the time, but if we need to do that, that's what we do. And what we do is we have them in my center console. I have a four-gallon bucket that fits right into my uh, fish boxes, so I can put four buckets there. If I don't use them, I refreeze them. And I have a chump chucker. So what I do is... Is the AC on? Because it's hot as hell in here. Are you guys hot, or is it just me? I'm blowing all this heat. <laughs> um, it all depends. So with my chum chucker, one flat or one four-gallon bucket gets me two hours of chunking. So I just figure it out from there. Um, it was interesting. I mean, it was three things in this past year that were the three, my three mantras. One, the mahi fishing was off the hook. It was amazing. So that was a given. Two, day chunking was more productive than trolling for us. And three... Uh, white marlin was amazing. So that was the mentality that I was going to the canyon with. It wasn't to troll and to beat myself up for three, four hours. That wasn't going to happen. I was going to do it for an hour tops until I figured out where these fish were sitting, and then I was day chunking. But there was some trips where we started with mahi, and it never left mahi. The guys had no interest to do anything else. So, I mean, that happened. So, And we'll get into that as well. So this is kind of an approach that we do for day chunking. Wherever the bite is at, wherever the fish have been, and wherever they're catching, and if they're not catching them on the troll, then guess what? You give it a shot, but what you're really doing is you're trying to study, you're working this whole area, figuring out where the best patches of fish are away from everybody where you can start your own slick. That's what you're doing. Does that make sense? 
What's the max depth that you'll chunk like that? 200, absolute. Well, deepest, that's it. Because if I'm going deeper than 200, they're really not active. They're just down there and they're just chilling. They're completely spooked. We have more success for those fish that are 100 and higher. Because they're still high in the water column, they're still interested in eating, but there's just too much boat traffic for them. They don't want to come stagger up. Stagger your depths or just go down? Absolutely stagger depth. So this, this drawing is not a hot dog, it's a boat actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's assume, yeah exactly, this is the front of the boat, this is the back. So what will happen is, is we, don't, we want to drop chunks and we want to drop jigs. So what we do is when we stagger, just think of it, so my chump chucker is going to be sitting here. And it's going to be dropping the baits here. And obviously, obviously, as you drift, they're going to just go deeper and further. So we'll stagger one at 100 feet out here. And we'll put that on a float. Drop another one here at 75 on a float. Stagger another one here at 50 on a float. And then we have one free with no sinker. And the rigs that we use, we use a Talica 12 two-speed, 65-pound braid. It's colored braid. So we know exactly every 25 feet is a color. So we know we're only dropping in four colors. Then we have a egg sinker. And then from the egg sinker, we have a section of mono, the length of the rod, no further, because then it's gonna to be too far for us to either gaff or harpoon the fish, right? And then the egg sinker and then the leader. And the leader we usually use is 60 fluoro. And we have them put up on coils, because sometimes when a yellowfin come into the slick and they're being really finicky, then we have to go down to 30 fluoro. So that's what we do. So we have them on coils, we'll have them labeled 60, 30, small circle hook, and then the base that we use are going to be squid, sardines, or what we found in these particular cases, they just wanted the actual chunks coming out of the machine, the butterfish chunks. How deep did you get those big guys at? Uh, we were hand feeding them right next to the machine at, at a certain point. They just, 100, 100 feet, 100 feet, so, so 100, and the reason that we have them away from the boat and not just off the rod tip straight down. And we're using, by the way, on these deeper ones, like six to eight ounces, depending on the current. The reason we have them staggered away from the boat on floats is because we still want to jig here vertically. And if you have these in here with jigs, you just, it just becomes a cluster. At least out here, these things are fishing. If we're catching them on jigs, these aren't interfering with us because they're out here still fishing while we're jigging underneath the boat. And when we jig, I'll mark off to the guys, all right, I'm reading fish at 75 feet. Now they know they get one of the jigging rods and they just drop it three colors and just start working it there. There's three different ways you can work the jig. You can butterfly it back to the boat, right? You can just hammer, you know, like Viking style, just get it to the death and just flitter it up and down. Or you can try you know, jerking the retrieves. You can try all different stuff that works, but you just figure out what's the best retrieve. But what you're doing is you're presenting your baits and your jigs down to where they're comfortable at. That's what you're doing. Because the problem with trolling over the top of them, you may never get them to come up. Right. You're chunking uh, weights. Are they six feet from the hooks, or you have them further up? Egg sinker, yep. then barrel. Exactly. And then leader. So it's six feet away. Six feet away, no matter what. Six foot leader, six foot leader. yeah. Um, we don't like to go longer than six foot because then they're way out there, the sinker's here, and you can't get to them unless you have a harpoon. And we use a harpoon. Anything over 75 pounds, we hit them with the harpoon. Otherwise, we just stick them. So. But that's a typical spread for when we're drifting and chunking is what we're doing during the daytime, mind you. Now let's get back to the trolling spread. So we've gotten to the canyon. We know where we're going to troll. We know we're going to troll. Let me talk. Let me start from scratch. I'll try to draw a little better because my hot dogs are kind of ugly. I stick it. Uh, so we have a tournament cable harpoon that's 20, 18 feet long. So my feeling is, with that setup, that's about right here. With only half of mine, I can stick them. I don't. I haven't tried throwing it because I haven't had to. With the 18 footer, I can just boop. I just stick it right into this gill plate, and, and it goes right through. It's counterweighted, so as I come back and go forward, that weight shoots that thing right through. So I can go right into his gill plate. That's what I try to shoot, either his eyeball or right through his gill plate. If I can get in his gill plate, it ain't gonna rip out. You get it on the back meat, you're gonna lose him. He's gonna rip it right out. So. Who makes that open? Tournament cable. So back of the boat. Motors, prop wash, prop wash, prop wash, 
front wash. Clean alley, clean alley, okay? Long rigger, short rigger, 45 degree rod holder, zero degree. And then center rigger, boom. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a typical spread of what we do. We do a nine rod spread. If I'm actively zigzagging, prospecting, running like eight to 10 knots, when I prospect, I can't put certain lures in and vice versa, because all I'm doing is just trying to get to where I'm going and cover as much ground as possible, looking for the life that I'm looking for. But let's just assume that I'm at six knots, I'm at the spot, I know where the tuna at, and now I want to fish. The first lure that we're going to put in are the heavier daisy chains. Now, I'm into rainbow, not because I'm that type of guy, I'm married with kids, but um, I'm into rainbow because you just don't know that particular day what color the squid is. You don't know if it's blue, green, yellow, whatever. So we tend to run rainbows for everything. So feel this daisy chain and you'll understand and pass it around. That's right here in a flat line position. I want to get under this bubble trail. I want to get in clean alley underneath the motors, right? So that's going to be here and it's going to be set up right where that back wall is. That's how close it is. My next lure I'm going to run is there's two different plugs on the market. There's bomber, which I don't like bomber because when I pull them out of the box, they have an attitude. So they are all over the place. I like the Magnum X wraps, but you have to change the hook to the four owners for size 4.0 owner. These will run straight, but you can't run these more than six, seven knots. It's just too much pressure. But those have caught big eyes for me, long fin, yellow fin, they've caught everything for me. That's going to be in the other flat line position. Because mind you guys, I'm not like this gentleman here that has an inboard. We have outboards. He has clean water. I don't. I got to find the clean water. See, we're all jealous of you, man. So they're gonna, this is going to be my flat line plug and daisy chain. And that's going to be right about where that wall is. My next position off the 45 degree is going to be a daisy chain. Now, mind you guys, with this daisy chain, I want as much splash and, and bling going on if you guys want to pass this around. These have birds in front of them, and that's going to be a daisy chain right here in this clean alley. So I have my flat lines, I have my daisy chain here, and then my short rigger. Guys, again, my goal is to get 60 lures in the water, 6-0. That's how many lures I want in the water, because again, we have a lot of bullshit going on with all these bubbles. So we have to do everything we can to show bait balls from our boats. What I'll do is I'll run this spreader bar. With this spreader bar, I will run a bird in front of it. And again, I want as much bling going on out there as possible. I want birds, I want chains, I want lures, I want all kinds of stuff. And this is going to be off my short rigger. The big thing about it running off my short rigger, yes, it is a lure. Yes, I'd love to catch fish with it, but it really is a teaser for my best lure in the spread. Spreader bar will be here in this clean alley. This one's going to be about four to five weeks back. And what you want is you want that spreader bar running in the water, and it's undulating. That's the word of the day. Undulation? You like that? Undulating? Okay. So you want that thing just kind of just riding the front side of the wave, right? So you want it to look as natural as possible. You don't want it to look like it's being dragged in the water. And then off my long rigger, I have my single Bally Joe shoot. Now, there's, there's two th reasons how we fish this back here, this Bally hoop. If I am tuna fishing, I am running either a five ounce head on calm days or eight to 13 ounce head on rough days. And you guys have all been there. Hopefully you're not out there when it's five to seven, but we fear. So the nice thing about those heavy Joe shoes, one, they're gonna stay in the water, and two, they're gonna run straight even on windy days. So that's what we'll do when we're tuna fishing, vice versa on the other side. Down here at the end of the bubble trail is when we run our center. We'll run a heavier lure with a bird so we can see it, right? Or we can run a Joe shoot if we're tuna fishing, or like what we've done this past year with this unbelievable white marlin bite, we moved these ballyhoo to one ounce heads, got rid of this daisy chain, so we ran a ballyhoo in front of the spreader bar, one behind the spreader bar, so it was a ballyhoo sandwich. Um, one ounce heads, and then a ballyhoo in the middle, so we had seven ballyhoo out, I'm sorry, five ballyhoo out, and now with a one ounce head, what was happening is those, those white marlin are coming up 
and eating our deep base that we never saw. Now, these things are skipping on the surface. Now they got to show themselves. So the whole bill was coming out, their whole chest, you could see everything. And now we were hooking these things up. And that we did this year because I've never had a mite marlin bite like that. And it was a lot of fun. So that's what we did. But if we are tuna fishing, we're running five to eight ounce Joe shoots in front and behind of the spreader bar. So that's, that's our spread. Any questions on that spread? Anybody doing different, anything different in their spread that's working for them? Yeah. No, straight butt. Now, what will happen is if you go over six knots, you're going to have to use a rubber band, double rubber band to pin it down to your flatline clip. But you don't want it off your rod tip because it's out, it's too much that you're losing out of the water. You want that thing running deep. And at six knots, those will get, they're a stretch 30, they get down to 20 feet. So, but yeah, you got you to have enough tension on your flatline clip or extra rubber bands to keep that thing in position. And yeah, just a straight tip. So we run TLD 50s. Um, I brought a 30 just because I didn't feel like carrying a 50. Um, my 30s have 800 yards on it. So I do 150 top shot and then the rest in 65 pound braid. But I won't go out there with more, less than 700 yards. Especially the last couple of years with all the big eyes. If you catch more than one big eye, you're going to get spooled. And I got to tell you guys, if you just made this commitment to run out there and you get the right bite and you lose them because you had three, 400 yards of line, that's a travesty. And you will be embarrassed when you get back to the dock. Yeah. They're all going to laugh at or you. Sooner, laugh. Do you. Or sooner. <laughs> do you double rig or triple rig your outriggers? Or? I do have three on my outriggers, but I found that two is fine. I mean, because again, let's, what I tell you, let's keep it real. I am not trolling for more than a couple hours. So by the time this is all spread up and you really give it a good look, you know, I'm already like, okay, this sucks. Let's go do something else. You know I mean? That, that's the reality of it, guys. You know, if I'm trolling for tuna and I'm mowing the lawn and it's not happening, I'm marking a tuna, I'm going to chump, you know. Um, now, if I'm prospecting, you know, I'm going to change up some lures, like the plug will be gone. I'll put another daisy chain there, and I'm going to go up to 8 to 10 knots and try to cover more ground. If I don't have any buddy boats are out, there's no life around, nobody's catching anything, nothing's going on. My guys are done with mine because we've got 50 in the box. We've already raised a couple white marlin. We want to add a tuna. That's what we'll do. But that's after everything else has been done and the boxes are filled already. Because what we won't do is go home with nothing. That won't happen. The only thing I haven't heard is, on uh, particularly the laws, the most successful lure I have is the uh, cedar plug. Okay, so here's the thing about cedar plug. Me personally, it's my go-to lure for bluefin inshore. Years ago, I used to run a lot of cedar plugs. But think about my mentality, why I don't want to run a cedar plug. I want to get underneath my prop wash, so I lose that position. So that's, that's why I stopped running cedar plugs. But also years ago, the tuna fishing and trolling was much better than it is now. So back then, you could probably put anything out and it was working. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing and I was catching a dozen a trip. I mean, you know, so now it's a completely different game. Which ones do you run short? The, all the heavy stuff that I want to go deep. So um, the plugs and the heavy weighted daisy chain is what I'm running for deep. Any questions on this trolling setup if for outboard? triples or even quads, does that make it harder to catch fish with all the... Um, that's a good question. And I, so eventually I'm going to have to figure that out. Right? I mean, you, you do? Do you run two or all four? You know, now that you said that with the wash, I was like, I should run two, but I run, run four. Here's the problem of running two versus four. You're putting a lot of strain on those two that are running on, on the lower units. That's the problem. Yeah, you could stagger and play with the hours, but the problem is, is that why put that extra strain on your lowers, especially if we're both that big and if you're running four, there's a reason you have four. You know? But what you can do is make sure that your motors are not trimmed up or down, that they're completely down. Because if they're trimmed up like when you were running to get there and forget, you have that much more prop wash out there. The other thing you can do with fours is just move everything one wake further back. Find a cleaner water further back. Also what you can do is you can go with like four spreader bars and then just get everything further back. I've seen some of the bigger white water center console boats, they'll run seven spreader bars. Like way back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, what the hell? I mean, it kind of makes sense in theory, you yeah, know. How far back? Sorry. sorry about that. Mm -hmm. How far back will you shoot in your uh... six, fifth or sixth wake? Is um, my long you rigger? Okay. Yeah, on the long rigger. On the outriggers, right? on the outriggers correct. Sixth to seventh wake. Yeah.
Any other questions on the trolling spread before we get into some other stuff, guys? You ever use dredges? I started running dredges last year. It became a pain in the ass. Complete pain. It was just, you know, it's, you know what happened? I was running them from here. So I have a cleat here, a zero degree cleat, and it was sitting right here, right where I wanted. But the problem is, is when we get a bite, this is the one that concerned me the most because sometimes if I make a turn, it's going right into my motors. You know, I'm like, I'm like, is it really worth it? And these two lures, especially the daisy chains that are heavy, are getting down similar doing to what that's doing. Not as big of a profile, but a lot easier to work with than this thing back there. And I was using that off of a rod, a rod and reel. I didn't have the, you know, the luxury of having an LP electric, you know what I'm saying? Like the Canyon Runner, they do it great because they have a lingering Pittman electric. They just hit a button, whoop, it's on, it's up. You know, plus they have an outrigger that's strong enough to hold that thing. With the weight, I don't. Two guys, I don't know, it, it gets a little difficult. You know, you're better off trying to get multiple lures that you can easily handle and you don't have to worry about getting caught in your, in your props. That's just my belief, you know. Easier is simpler, I think it's better. Especially, I mean, I already got nine rods out there to begin with, so. Five. Yeah. So these are the rods you use? Yeah, so TLD 30s or 50s for trolling, again, it's all about line capacity, as long as you got set at least 750 yards. For chunking, I use Talica 12s or 16, so these are my jigging and my chunking rods. Now, it's not on this rod, it's on a Terez rod. These Travalas are way too whippy. Um, so I use it on a Therese rod. Um, stiff, right? Yes, it's stiffer, but what it has is parabolic lift. So what happens is, if you hold that for a second, what happens on this, this is really whippy. On the Therese is when you lift this up, this thing wants to straighten itself up. So it's very stiff here, but still limber at the tip. So I use the Therese rod with Italica reels. So, and Penn, they have their own versions of rod that have parabolic lift, and they also have good conventionals, you know, in that size as well. Questions? We went over chunking. We went over daytime chunking. We went over jigging and chunking, trolling. Um, we went over white marlin. What we want to do to just change the spread off of white marlin. We're just going to do a one ounce Joe shoot and replace that five or eight ounce Joe shoot with a one. So that way you could see when he comes to feed. The last thing I want to go over is mahi fishing. Now, if you're looking at. Actually. Can you send it down the middle on, on your uh, spread? Um, any heavy lure that's going to run straight with a bird. So it would be something like a big jet like this with a bird in front. Okay, cool. And the reason I run that is just so I can see it. So and what are you jigging with when you jig? When I jig, I use these guys. Butterflies. Butterflies. Okay. Yep, butterflies. Um, at night, if there's a lot of current, we'll go with a real heavy one which is like eight ounces, but you want the ones that are the newer style that are the knife edge, that are real, that are real vertical. To where I'm marking the fish. Where I'm marking, so if I'm marking them at 100, with these, this color, all my lines have color braid on it. So every 25 feet is one color. And if it's 100 feet, four color, boom, you're right in the zone. And there's three ways you can jig it. You can butterfly it back, you can methodical jig, or you could just get it to that depth and just hammer style. You know, all of them work. Um, pot fishing. So guys, <clears throat> this is usually a lifesaver for um, my crew. And to be quite honest, this is the anchor going down to the, that's the main line going down. If you're looking at that pot and you're approaching it, can you tell me which way the current is going? No. Think about it. The ball is the one that's, this is the five fly. The current's going that way. Yep, current's going that way. Now, there's going to be sometimes a booby trap line. You know what that is, guys? <laughs> Stay the fuck off my pot. Pretty much, exactly. There's going to be a booby trap line that's going to be on this. So whenever we approach a pot, we approach it from this direction into the current or with the current, in or against. What we won't do is troll this way because if you do, you're going to get caught with that line in your prop, which is going to be a bad day for you, right? Now, the reason we also like to troll this way and not this way is because we want to see how the mahi are setting up on this pot. Because think about it, I'm prospecting, right? So I'm trolling in 500 feet of water, back to 1,000, and I've been doing this for an hour, and my crew's looking at you like you're looking at me like, Cap, you suck, we've caught nothing, this trip sucks, right? So I'm like, okay, there's a pot, Two miles away, we need some action. So we're going to troll by it, right? 
When we troll by it, my long rigger, I want to keep it 10 to 15 feet off of that ball because we don't want to get caught up on it, right? Then what you do is we got center console. So if your boat is 30 foot, I get one of my guys with a bucket. He'll go up to the front of the boat. Now, you don't want to get that guy that throws like this. You want the guy that can throw like that, right? That's the first thing you want. So what happens is you're trolling in a straight line. And you know you guys have guys in your crew that throw like that. Some of us have many. Oh, that's not good. You got to leave those mitches at home. <laughs> so what happens is, is you're going to troll towards the pot. And the idea, guys, is you want that guy that can throw it and lay it out there at least the distance of the boat. So by the time your boat gets to the ball, he's going to look in the water and say, Cap, there's a dozen. Oh, there's two dozen. Dude, there's like 50 here. Oh, shit, there's like 100 here. Okay, now we know. As my spread is coming, I already know. I'm like, are they little guys, big guys, or gaffers? Like, oh, they're all chicken. Boom, hook those guys. He's going to throw again at this pot. I'm like, what's the read? Oh, there's another 50. There's another 100, whatever. We're going to troll past it. We're going to clear these lines, and I'm going to say, okay, guys, there's 50 mahi here, and there's some big ones. What do you want to do? Let's pull in everything. Let's throw out the light spinners and crush these things. Now, the, uh, bunker chunks. I'm sorry, butterfish chunks. Butterfish chunks. They're already cut up, uh, and we carry them in four-gallon buckets already cut up for day chunking and for this purpose only. So they're already cut up. So, and the nice thing about butterfish chunks, as they're cut up, you can throw them a long distance. Because you want these things to be able to hit water, float down, and then whatever's down there is going to come up and see them. And then you have a visual on them. Then you can see the size. If there's white marl in there, could be some tuna in there. We've caught all of that stuff with it. You know? But it's also, think about what you're doing. You're just getting your crew involved at this point. Because there's so many beers they can have when they're like, this trip sucks. Right? <laughs> It's like, this trip really sucks, and you suck, Cap. You know, but you start getting like 20, 30 mahi bouncing all over the place on light tackle, everyone's happy all of a sudden, right? So that's the deal. So that's what you do. Let's assume that you've gotten to this pot, and you're starting to catch the smaller guys, and you see the real big ones, but they're not eating. There's a couple things you can do, and I'm going to give you guys my secret weapon for catching these bigger mahi. Do you guys know what a file fish is? Sure. No. They look like a trigger fish. You ever seen them out there? Mm -hmm. That's a file fish. If you can get a file fish, you will catch every big mahi on this thing. We've gone and we've seen these 20 pounds. We're like, damn, man, they won't eat anything. We ate all the, caught all the little brothers and sisters. They're done. They're toast. But we want these bigger ones, but they won't eat anything. So what happened was, I remember one trip, we were cleaning a big mahi and it was a file fish. And we're like, dude, we got to catch a file fish. So we threw a cast net on. They just laugh at it. They just give you the middle finger and laugh. They're like, you can't catch me with that. But your long-handled squid net, what you do is you think you can go up and just dip them, and you can't do that. They're just too smart for that. What you do is once you got them in your sights, you just take this thing and slam it over the top of them, and then they freak out, and some of them jump right in, and then you just scoop them that way. <laughs> and then slam it, just boom, and they're just like, Wah! then they just jump right in. There's blue runners on that pot. You, you... Blue runners and all that stuff is easy to catch. Blue runners, jacks, you could just use a sabiki for them. Yeah. That's easy. But file fish, no, file fish yeah, is the, is bro. We're, we're going to see each other next year and be like, yo, Cap, file fish was crazy. Those work, but they ain't not like a file fish because those are real fast. A runner on a travel and yeah. it's good light. It light slides action, out. Yeah. It slides out. You take the file fish and just chunk it? No, 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 hole. Oh, okay. Live no, line. hole. Yeah, live line. Hook them right through the back dorsal. They like the yeah, stuff. Yeah, they like the live stuff because their their skin is like really tough. Hit, you're gonna it's going to be insane. It. Yeah. It's going to be insane. It's going to be like every big fish. They, so the one time we figured it out, they were like body blocking each other trying to get to the file fish. Like literally coming under the boat and just attacking each other trying to get to this thing. Well, it turns the head. It's crazy. It's, crazy. it's nuts. And that's what they've been wanting to catch. You just can't catch them. And they get frustrated. But now they're on a hook and they can't go nowhere. <laughs> so they're done. So that's how we do in mahi fishing, guys. And guys, this will be a lifesaver because here's what this is going to do for you guys. Not only is it going to get fish in the box, it's going to get morale up in the crew. Everyone's going to work harder. But what's going to happen is, is when you're night fishing and you're prospecting, you know, trolling around, trying to figure out where the life is, and you're in a canyon and there's absolutely no bite going on, there is nothing going on. You've hit the canyon. Everything is dead. 
But you know, when you were back at the tip, there was a couple of pots that had life and bait on them. Are you going to set up with the fleet out at the square catching nothing? Or are you going to run back here where you know there's life? And I can't tell you how many times that has saved my butt. And I've caught tuna chunking at night because I wasn't with the fleet catching nothing. I ran back to where the bait and the life was. So that's the two things that you're going to get out of mahi fishing during the daytime. One, you're going to get action morale for the crew. Two, you're prospecting for any kind of bait in life for the future for that night if you're spending the night. So that's my other little tip. Is there any questions? We covered chunking. We covered trolling. We covered day chunking. We covered white marlin. We covered mahi fishing. The only thing that I haven't covered that a lot of guys don't like to do because it just gets old and it's a lot harder now. Ten years ago it was easy and they were big is tile fish. You guys like the tile fish? Want me to cover it? Yeah. Okay. Tile fishing, the best bet that you want to do if you don't have spots is you want to go where your contour lines are the tightest on your chart plotter. That's going to show you the hardest breaks or depth breaks. And if you have that in relationship with lobster pots, that's tile fishing water. That's going to be the clay bottom that you want for mahi. And it's all it is, deep water fluking. It's just a high-low rig with any kind of bait you want, and you just drift it while you're mahi fishing. And if you catch a couple, once you catch one, you found them. You just short drift that area because they live in colonies. And once you found them, you just pound the shit out of them. And then mark that on your chart plotter because that's where they want to set up because they can only live in burrows. They, have, they make their own holes, and they have to be in clay bottom. It can't be mud because it collapses and can't be sand. It has to be clay. But that's how you find them. What about wahoo fishing? Wahoo fishing. If I want to try wahoo and I'm in a tournament, I will do wahoo. And what you do with wahoo is in your spread, these flat line ones become heavy weighted bonita plugs with drails and metal leader. And I put them, I just dedicate two rods for wahoo. So, so you do a tuna spread, but then you do just two? Correct and for a while, but what metal cable, and then I'll just put them here, that's all I'll do. I'm not going to dedicate a whole spread and go to 15 knots and put out four rods with bent butts, and I'm not going to do that. There's not enough wahoo up here for that. I've caught some wahoo, I haven't bit off my many. They're under the mahi at the pots. Yes, you can jig them then, absolutely. Take your throttle, you come to the pot, back it off, let everything sink, just punch it. Yeah, but the problem with right doing, up, yeah. You drop it, all your lures down. So then you, they'll go down in front of them. You start giving gas, it's going to come up. Right. Them up. But the problem is if you don't have metal, they're going to bite you off every right. time. Right. That's the problem. So that's why I have these. What's that? Teeth. Yeah, they have teeth. So that's why you got to put some kind of metal trace in front of them. Do that technique. And as long as you got metal trace, you're going to have a shot. If not, and they're there, more often than not, they're going to bite you off. Right. They, I mean, they're just going to go right through the mono. So. What weight? Eight? Yeah. For the, oh yeah, these are like 10, 12 ounce drills. You want them deep. They're, those Wahoo are going to be deep. So, but yeah, but I, um, I usually don't even bother with Wahoo. If I get lucky and have to catch one, and most of the time I got mono out there, because the problem is here's a trade off. There's Wahoo, but then you're not going to get the marlin or the tuna. You know, so that's kind of the deal there. So, that's kind of what I do. Any questions? Anything else in the spread you guys want to go over? Are we baiting the uh, tile fish? Oh, baits for tile fish. So, really good bait is dogfish. That was my secret weapon I got it from a commercial guy. About that big, like a, a little bit bigger than a postage stamp, hook the hook right through the middle. So dogfish is real good, but what I found is the best bait is tile fish themselves. You get those nice goldens, same thing, hook it through the middle, that's the best bait. So we sacrifice the little ones, we chop his ass up and use him for bait. So, <laughs> yeah, he just tear his ass up. So, that's what we do for tiles. Any questions, guys? Do any daytime sword or? Going to invest in a Beastmaster to do it. Um, it's an electric grill, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's electric grill. And you're going to have to be in like 1,200, 1,500 feet of water. Um, and I've, I kind of figure out some ways, places I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it off the 100 square. Um, the contour lines that make there the most sense. But I just haven't really, I don't think I convinced my crew to do it. I mean, because let me tell you something. Have you ever considered what exactly you're going to be doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I got the Beastmaster 2 last uh, season, but I used it once. Right. <laughs> they're, listen, they're catching them, but guys, here's the problem with that. You're going to have to convince your crew to sit there for three hours in the middle of nowhere. Just think that through. With no mahis, looking at one rod tip. Guys, this is what you're going to be looking for for three hours. No chunking, no jigging, no trolling, no nothing. 
Just, th just think that one through. Uh, I don't think my crew's going to go for it. They'll throw my ass over the board before that. that's going to happen. So if you come into your area that you're going to fish, or you, or you come across uh, some feeding, okay. are, are you going to approach it casting into it, or are you going to approach it with a, a spread? Like you just, you're, you're running, you're running. And you see, see the tuna, friends. they're breaking water. What are you doing? Trolling. Okay. The reason I want to do troll is for a couple reasons. One, I want to see how many fish are there, where are their bait balls, how deep are they. You may just see some off the surface. There may be thousands and you don't know. Something about. You know, you could run into it and then just start chunking and jigging, which I've done as well. It all depends on how wide. Are they going in one direction or not? If they're just staying and doing circles? So the outboards aren't that big of a liability that, that you, would, you would do that regardless? You never know until you start running through them. But if you don't want to take a chance, you just run in there and just start throwing lures and jigs and throwing meat, you could do that too. But it all depends on what they're doing because I don't, if I, I'm going to watch them for a while. And I want to see if they're moving in one direction. Are they staying in that area? Are they going up and down? you got to watch what they're doing. But they're always acting different. You know, We had a crappy trip. Went out to the Hudson. Caught a yellowfin at Texas. Got to the Hudson. Did some tar fishing. Great tar fishing day. Bunch of mahi. No tuna. My guy was bored. He was like, let's go look for bluefin on the way in. On the way in, like literally just outside of the tip of the Hudson. There they were. 50 to 100 pounders all over the place. But they were doing what bluefin do, which are very tricky. They were just sitting on the surface, just cruising. I'm like, oh boy, they ain't gonna bite. We ain't got no chance. I said, let me just troll the spread past them. We still had the canyon spread out. And it wasn't my bluefin spread. So we just put out the spreader bars and they were just attacking the spreader bars. I'm like, here we go. Really? We put the spreader bars out for them. Just, just put them right in the prop watch. Just put them out. And we were just trying to get everything together, and they were just started eating the spreader bars. Go figure. I mean, they changing it up is never a bad. Thing. You never, yeah, you never know. I mean, it was just, you know, they. This is when they don't bite. When they're just cruising on the surface, not feeding. They're just, you just see a wake, and all you see is all these wakes. I just got up in front of them and just trolled right past their nose, and they started eating. I'm like, damn, here we go. You never know. But what it comes down to is you got to be ready. Um, on our boat, um, I don't have a picture of it. We have. 40 rod holders bonded on a T top and all across the top. What did you say? 40? 40. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, you know, think about it chunking rods, jigging rods, nine trolling rods, you know, spinning rods. I mean, everything's got to be ready when we get there. It looks like a porcupine, is what it looks like. Tripping over the I run a contender. Yeah, I'm ready for it. Yeah, I'm ready for everything. Twin 300s is what I run now. I have 300 gallons now. And I'm like 1.4 to 1 1.5 if I'm at 30 knot cruise, which I don't like to do. I like to do 40, 45. And yeah, we're we're everybody else, I'm 1.5, 1.6 to 1. You know, and then I get 70, 80 miles, but I don't like to go that slow. What size uh, contender? I have the 31 fish around. Oh, wow. Yeah, the 31 fish That's around. A lot of fish rides. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them now. I made them popular. Holla. You know <laughs> hey, listen. Ten years ago, when I used to hit the canyon, everyone said I was crazy. You're crazy, Cap. You're going in a 30-footer. Now it's normal, right? Yes. Things have changed. I mean, it has changed. I mean, everyone thought I was crazy. Like, Phil in the canyon was like, Fred, you're crazy. I can't believe you're doing it. I'm like, man, everybody's doing it now. You do overnight still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a cabin in my center con. It's a fish-around design. Oh, okay. So it's got the cabin so I can sleep two guys in it. So we do three eyes on our overnights. You saw the center console out in Montauk. They had the uh, green stick. Yes, I saw that, too. So on, a, on a 27 footer, I saw right. it on a smaller one. He was out there at the 100 square with me. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of tension pressure on a small boat, though. Dude. Rip the top off. Bro, for real. But I saw him. I saw him. He, he was working right where I was, and he stopped trolling and started chunking like I was. Because guys were catching him on a chunk in the middle of the day. Mm. Uh, that's a lot of tension on a boat. What's that? Uh, so this is a canyon yellowfin spread. On my bluefin spread, I go to four rods. They go way, way back, and then with Joe shoots four ballys. That's it. Oh, only four. Oh, hold on. Let me take that back. I did do. I did do um, a little bit of a experiment, and it actually worked out. So here's a. You know, this is what you were asking about. So there's a bluefin tuna spread, but here's the difficulty with a bluefin tuna spread. Everything has to be slowed down. 
now we're talking three to four knots. That is the speed. You got your spreader bar, you got your outriggers. So we'll run four lines. So this one's gonna be out three to 400 yards, depending on my, my mood that day. No, this is Ballyhoo. Eight ounce Joe shoot, white on whites and blue on whites, right? So these are out at 400, and then I have another set in here at 200 yards. Yeah, no, they're way back, guys. And the idea is this. These ballyhoo have to be on ballyhoos underneath the surface way back because these bluefin are very skittish, especially these bigger ones. So you want to be able to see the school or the tuna, pass them, no more wake, and then these things come in, and that's how they eat them. I also have them rigged on 25-foot leaders, fluorocarbon, 80 to 130-pound fluoro leader on wind-ons. So you just get a 200-pound barrel swivel down tied to your main line. Then you get the other side of your 25-foot leader tied to that. That'll go through your guide, so now it's a wind-on. And then that's crimped to your ballyhoo. Oh, I'm sorry, to your Joe shoot, and then you rig it that way. And that's what you got to do. You got to get super stealthy. You got to go slow and low is what I call. So what will happen is I'll put out this four rod spread. And these are for bluefin that are 50 to 100 pounds. These aren't for these little 27 pound inchers. I'm not interested in those. I want the real big ones. But what will happen is if I get really bored, then I'll put a little cedar plug in here. Or I'll put a spreader bar in here just for the hell of it. Just to catch those little schoolies. And then I'll still catch those and it won't affect what we're doing back here with the big guys. But the big guys aren't eating these guys. Unless that one day we're coming from the canyon and they just committed suicide. But uh, it's low and slow on big bluefin. And then cedar plugs and little, you know. Uh, actually, the best one is this guy right here. Is the mini mamba, um, either in the purple and black or the blue and white. And this is imitating sand eels. That's what these are good for. So I like these for the smaller fish. So any more questions? Any questions on bluefin? What did you say was on the outside there from bluefin? Um, these are going to be the Joe shoots. And then on the inside, I'll run a cedar plug or one of these mini mambas for just this little schoolie fish. And they're just on the other side of prop wash. Remember, we're at two to four knots, so there's not a lot of prop wash. On the Joe shoots, uh, you have weight on that? So no, I use the heavier ones. I go with five and eight ounce Joe shoot heads. And I have 12s and 13s as well. Okay. You know, But no, I just go with a heavier weight. I just think you start putting chin weights in there and it counterbalances. That's why I asked. Okay. It just, you just go with a heavier head. Any other questions? Guys, you were fantastic. Listen, if you have any questions and you need any information, feel free to reach out to me. I have my cards. Just get on my website. Any questions, feel free. You guys are always a friend. How do you float your staggered uh, when you're chunking? You dip Ready rig floats is the floats I use. I could use balloons, but the problem, they get caught in a mono. You know. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, uh, you bring sardines and? Okay. Sardines and squid. Squid and butterfish. Squid and butterfish. I bring them all. About how much flat flat each? Uh, I get two hours out of every flat. So if I'm going to chunk for four hours, I'm going to bring two flats. Two flats nice each. Job. Exactly. Oh, here you go. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Line, Absolutely, man. Thank you very much. What do you chunk from? Yeah. If you, don't you can chunk for them. You can chunk for them. You can use jigs. Thank you. You can use jigs. You can use any of that stuff. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank hope you enjoyed it. Good. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Certainly did. We've got to put them in water.